I would like to welcome you again to another episode of the Busy Lawyer's Guide to Evidence with Renee Valadares. We are so lucky to have Renee here for another installment, and this one is on updates to the federal rules of evidence. So he's gonna provide you with some updates on the federal rules. We are also very pleased and excited to announce um, that once again, we have Justice Text as a sponsor for these Engage and Exchange series on evidence. This, as you all know, is a free member benefit to NACDL members, and we are happy to be able to provide that to everyone for free, thanks to sponsors like Justice Text. So for right now, I'll turn it over for just a quick minute to Dave Shee Marotra from Justice Text to give us some information about that. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Vanessa. Super excited to be here again for another episode hosted by Renee. My name is Dave Shi, and I'm one of the founders at Justice Text. We've built a tool um, that's designed to help defense attorneys save hours reviewing digital evidence. This includes body cams, jail calls, courtroom proceedings, all of that. I'll show you really quickly how it works, and then feel free to reach out to me afterwards um, if you have any questions. But at a very high level, Justice Text is the website. Let's say you're an attorney that just got 50 jail calls for a given case. You can just go in, um, select those files from your local file system. And after a couple of seconds, you can click transcribe and we'll generate a rough automated transcript for you directly within the tool. When you look at the transcript, essentially what you'll see on the left-hand side is a rough transcription of any audio that was detected in that conversation. You can scroll through, search for certain keywords. Let's say I'm looking all references um, to the word license. I can just go to that section in the video, press play, and it will jump right there. If I wanted to clip out this section of the video to use in a cross-examination or impeachment, I can do that super easily as well. Um, so let's see, today is March 8th. After a couple of seconds, I'll have a short video file um, created in the bottom right-hand corner. And a lot of attorneys tell us this is super useful because it's just so much more powerful to be able to directly show um, the video when you're trying to cross-examine someone or you know use it in a presentation. Can I have your suspicion? So that's a high level overview of how the tool works. Um, we actually started building Justice Text as a school project out of Chicago um, after noticing just how there was a massive disparity in the technology built for prosecutors and public defenders. Ultimately, our goal is to help y'all uh, provide the best representation possible. The tool is $100 a month and you can get started for free. I'll share some information in the chat, but let me hand it over to Renee for the presentation. Well, thanks a lot, Dev Shi, and thank you very much, Vanessa. And uh, um, the uh, Justice Text is a great product. I mean, that's what our world nowadays is, is uh, you know, it's videos and audio and all that. And sometimes it's extremely difficult to manage all that. And Justice Text provides a really nice way of managing that. So very, very useful tool. And, and, and thanks to Vanessa, as well as uh, all the great folks at NACTO uh, for, for hosting this presentation today. You know, NACTO, as I will see, as I will show very concretely, when we're talking about some of the amendments uh, to, the federal, to the federal rules of evidence, NACTO plays a huge role, really, in our world. And, uh, and it's just, uh, and I'm very thankful for that. Again, I'll talk about that when we get specifically to changes to federal rule of evidence 702 dealing with experts. So now what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna go ahead and share screen and uh, start my PowerPoint so, so we can get started here. Um, and uh, today we're gonna be talking about, as Vanessa said, this is an update on what's going on with the federal rules of evidence. Um, and, you know, and there's a lot of stuff that is going on right now. As you will see, there's some major amendments to a number of important rules that are playing out uh, as we speak. And, uh, and it's really critical, I think, for all of us to know, to, to know what's going on. Um, as Vanessa said, of course, if you have any questions or whatever, I'll be more than happy to go ahead and field them 
Um, there's a lot of material to cover. So if we cannot get to all your questions, you know, don't hesitate to go ahead and send me an email uh, and I'll be more than happy to either, you know, touch base with you via email or we can set up a phone call or, a, you know, or a Zoom call, whatever it may be. But please do not hesitate to go ahead and reach out. I try to get back to you as quickly as possible. You know, I usually get back to you within 24 hours. Now, um, this is again my email, and uh, the the uh, the the format of this presentation will you know will basically be, of course, focusing on what are you know changes to the federal rules of evidence. Uh, much of the substance that we cover uh, is in, in in the book of the Defender's Guide to Federal Evidence, and uh, uh, as you can, and that is of course available in the NACTO website. All royalties go to support NACTO's phenomenal work with uh, NACTO's Fund for Criminal Justice. You know, it is an outstanding uh, not-for-profit that really focuses focuses on criminal justice reform, which really is uh, is a critical thing uh, now and has been for, for many years. Um, as far as uh, the illustrations in the presentation, as always, I, I tried to go ahead and, and showcase, you know, how important the law is in popular culture by, you know, by showcasing books, uh, movies, and that sort of thing that feature trials and that sort of thing, like we have here, the trial of Lizzie Borden. But this, uh, this month, you know, being that is Women's History Month, we'll go ahead and really pay a lot of attention to those amazing women that, you know, that have, that have had an impact in our system of justice, in making our system of justice better. Um, now, let's go ahead and start here with our substance. We're gonna be covering basically uh, three big changes, I'm sorry, seven big changes to the federal rules. And then we're gonna, in addition to that, we're gonna talk about a change that already occurred two years ago, that's to, uh, to federal rule of evidence for, for B prior bad acts. Uh, while the change you know, did take place in 2020, it's still important to go ahead and highlight it as, uh, as an almost a very important change. But we're gonna be talking about such things like the rule of completeness, illustrative aids, juror questions, witnesses prior statements, testimony by experts, uh, statements against, against interest and summaries to prove content. So again, very important stuff that we're gonna be covering here uh, in the next you know, hour, 45 minutes or so. Now, uh, before I get started, let me talk a little bit about the amendment process. So the amendment process starts with the advisory committee on the federal rules of evidence. Now I'm a member of the advisory committee it is a great committee. It meets twice a year. And uh, what happens is that the advisory committee is always keeping an eye on, on, on what are the changes that should be taking place to the rules of evidence. And the way it does it is by looking at, you know, cases, how courts are reacting, you know, where are areas where there seems to be a gap, a void in, you know, in the evidence rule, in the evidence rules, what are areas that seem to need, you know, some touching up and what are areas that really need a new rule? And you see all those three things in the different rules we're gonna be talking about. Once a, a, a proposed rule is uh, amendment is discussed by the advisory committee, then it goes to a judicial conference of the US uh, to specifically the Committee on Rules and Procedure, that's a standing committee. Then that's if, if that if the standing committee approves it, then it goes to a judicial conference, then it's transmitted to the Supreme Court and finally to Congress, and then it becomes effective. So this process takes a while. It takes, you know, about two years. Uh, but, you know, but again, I think I found it to be a very deliberate process. It's open to public comment and all that. And it is very important for our side, for the defense bar, to have a voice in that, and NACTO plays a 
critical role in having a voice in this amendment, as we'll as we'll talk about, especially when it comes to amendment uh, to, to to amendments to Federal Rule of Evidence 702 on experts. The approach we're going to be talking about is that we're going to talk about the rule. We're going to go ahead and do as it exists now. The rules that exist now, we're going to go ahead and do an overview of the rule. We're going to talk a little bit about background for the rule. Then we're going to talk about, you know, problems to the rule. You know, is there a gap that, you know, that needs to be filled? Does the rule need to be changed? Uh, or, you know, are, do we need to address a problem that is currently not in the rule? Then we're going to talk about how does the proposed amendment look? And then we're finally going to talk about what is the status with that specific amendment. So that's kind of how we're going to go ahead and do. And at points, I'm going to go ahead and give examples of how the rule is currently operating, some of the problems that you know that are being experienced with the current operation of the the the, the rule and that sort of thing. Now, let's go ahead and get started by talking about the rule of completeness. That is Federal Rule of Evidence 106. Now, um, let me one moment here, please. Uh, so here with the rule, um, if uh, um, the way that, that the rule is currently, that it's, it's currently set is that if a party introduces all or part of a writing or recorded statement, it's a critical thing, a writing or recorded statement, an adverse party may require the introduction of any other part or any other writing or recorded statement that in fairness ought to be considered. Okay, so we have several elements there. One, you know, a party, the government, introduces a writing or recording statement. Okay, so they introduce your client's uh, written statement or they introduce your client's recorded statement, or they introduce a writing, uh, a, a statement made by a co-defendant. And let's say that, you know, that it meets, it, that it meets Bruton or a co-conspirator, whatever it may be. If they do that, then you, we have the right to go ahead and introduce any other part of that writing uh, or recording that in fairness should be considered, okay? That's the bottom line with the rule of complete, completeness. That's what we all, what we all learn in, uh, in law school. As you will see, however, there are several problems with that rule. Now, um, in the way of background, as it exists right now, uh, Federal Rule of Evidence 106 is a codification of the common law. And, uh, and again, the, the idea, is that you know fairness demands that if a party wants part of this writing or part of this recording in, well, the other party should be able to introduce other parts of that writing or recording that um, that uh, in fairness should be introduced. The Supreme Court has said in uh, in uh, uh, Beecham versus Rainey that you know nothing. That under the, the under roof under federal rule 106, that when a party does do what we've been talking about, introduces por a portion of a document, a portion of a recording, and in uh, uh, and and the opposing party wants to introduce another part of that writing or recording, that material is gonna be, as the court put it here, ipso facto relevant. It is gonna be relevant uh, under rule, federal rule of evidence. 401 uh, and 402. Now uh, let's talk about uh, this. Is a defense favorable case. This is right out of uh, out of my book. This is the Walker case. This is and this illustrates the operation of this rule in a way that is favorable to us. So what happened here is that the defender was a firefighter. The uh, uh, the case was an extortion case and extortion under power of official right. Um, and supposedly what was going on is that the, uh, the defendant here, again, a firefighter, was extorting money from an apartment building um, and dealing with his position of being a, a firefighter. Now, 
The defendant, uh, there were two trials here. And the first, the first trial ended up resulting in a mistrial. At that first trial, the defendant testified. Now, at the second trial, the defendant did not testify. The defendant did not take the stand. What the government did is that the government wanted to introduce 14 pages of transcripts of the defendant's testimony in the first trial. And uh, uh, of course, you know, unsurprisingly, the government introduced the parts of the defendant's prior testimony that were favorable to the defendant, uh, to the government, but conveniently did not present parts of the testimony that had indeed been uh, uh, favorable uh, to the defendant. The defendant, of course, objects. The defendant wants to go ahead and introduce parts of the uh, uh, of his testimony that were favorable. The district court, however, um, denies the request. Okay, denies the request. The defendant is moving under Federal Rule 106, the rule of completeness. Now. The Seventh Circuit, you know, notes that uh, that that uh, in this case, the rule of completeness demands that the the uh, the portions of the testimony that the defense wanted should have gone in. You know, they met the requirements of the rule of completeness. Here, you had a uh, you had a transcript uh, that was being used by the government. The government was uh, unfairly using part of it, but not using the other part of the testimony that would have given a more fuller picture to the jury as to really what the defendant's testimony at the first trial had been all about. So the, the Seventh Circuit says this is a violation of uh, federal rule of, of uh, evidence 106. Um, the, uh, the circuit notes that um, that in this case, the, uh, uh, the testimony, those portions that the defense wanted or the testimony should have come in. And uh, because in this case, the error was not harmless, the Seventh Circuit ends up sending the case back. So this is an illustration of how the rule of completeness operates and how it operates in our favor. Now, problems. Problems with the current state of the rule of completeness. There's several problems, and I'll illustrate them by looking at some cases where the courts have ruled against us. Now, and, and, and the bottom line is that oftentimes, whenever courts can, they'll rule against us. They'll figure a way that they can squeeze the rule and, uh, and make it favorable for the prosecution. And currently, we've got several problems with the rule as it exists. Number one, it is only limited to writings or recordings. So, for instance, let's say that in the case that I just mentioned, in the Walker case, let's say that the government had that transcript, okay? Now, but let's say that, you know, that, they, um, that there also existed statements by the defendant that, um, let, let's, let's strike that. Let me use a different example. So let's say for instance, that a co-defendant in, 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 in the Walker case testifies about, you know, this extortion scheme and testifies about, you know, or, or excuse me, or gave a statement, uh, a, a written statement dealing with a Walker statement and uh, our involvement in that case. Let's say, that also that co-defendant made oral statements to the police that were not included in the written statement, but because of course in the written statement, the police just wants to put that, the, the, the portions that are, that are favorable to the prosecution. So you have, again, a written statement made by a co-defendant where the co-defendant says that, you know, Walker, uh, the defendant in the case that I just talked about, was involved in this extortion scheme. At the same time, that same court offended made oral statements to the police, and let's say they were not recorded, in which the, the court offended explained 
that in fact, while Walker may have known about this extortion scheme, Walker was really not a participant in it. So co-defendant says, yes, Walker knew about it. He heard us talking about it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but he did not know about it. Well, under the, the, under the way that the rule is structured currently, 106 is structured, the oral part of that statement would not be coming in. The government could use the written statement of the co-defendant, but not the oral part, which again would result in a, you know, in a terrible miscarriage there. So oral statements are not included. It has to be uh, a writing or a recorded statement under the current 106, under Federal Rules of Evidence 106. Now, so not only is not only is an oral statement not covered by assertive conduct, it's not covered. For instance, uh, sign language is not covered. In addition to that, hearsay is not allowed. So hearsay is not allowed, and I'll demonstrate how that also creates significant problems, uh, oftentimes uh, problems for the defense. Um, and uh, let me talk about a couple of examples here that will illustrate the current problems with the rule as it exists right now. And again, as I said, there are two problems. One is that the rule as it is right now is limited to writings or recordings. It does not encompass oral statements. It does not encompass assertive conduct, such as, you know, say sign language and that sort of thing. In addition to that, it does not cover hearsay. So let's look at how this plays out. The Morales case is a really good case that, you know, that illustrates um, the fact that, you know, the rule only applies currently to writings or recordings. So let's look at what Morales has to say. Morales is a kidnapping case, and it is a Ninth Circuit case. Now, what happened here is that the, uh, the jury convicts the defendant, uh, and, uh, and this is, again, a kidnapping case. Now, what happened is that an agent interviewed the defendant. Now, um, at trial, the, uh, um, the, uh, the, the court allows testimony by the uh, agent uh, dealing with what it is that the defendant had told him. Uh, so the agent testifies about portions of the defendant's post-arrest interview, but, but the district court does not allow the defendant from getting into exculpatory statements made by the defendant in that same interview, okay? So that's where we're at now. Uh, the defendant, of course, you know, tries to get this uh, the statements in. The defendant, you know, points to a rule of completeness. The defendant says, "Hey, look, you know, the the prosecution is using the statements of my client. My client also said exculpatory things here. Those statements should be coming in." This record says, "You know, sit down. You know, uh, that they don't come in." And uh, then on appeal, the Ninth Circuit agrees with the district court. The Ninth Circuit, you know, says that the rule 106, Federal Rule of Evidence 106, quote, applies only written and recorded statements. And in this case, the statements have been, you know, those of the defendant. The defendant made the statements to the agent. Uh, the statements were oral statements. They were not written statements. The government was able to introduce them because they came under the opposing party uh, um, uh, exclusion to the um, to the, uh, the, the, uh, the hearsay rules. And uh, because of that, the government was able to introduce them. But then come the defense trying to contextualize the statements and the court, both the district and the circuit court say, no, that cannot come in. That is a terrible miscarriage of justice right there. And even so, they, so the, the Ninth Circuit says, we understand that other courts have given a broader meaning 
to what should come in under 106 and that you know even oral statements should come in. But still, the Ninth Circuit finds against the defendant. Big problem right there. And this problem typically, when you see cases decided under 106, uh, criminal cases that is, you know, they obviously, they, they result, uh, this problem results in a, you know, in a huge detriment for the defense. Now, let's look at another problem uh, also created by the rule as it exists right now, and that is the issue of, uh, um, of uh, or, or the problem that currently the rule uh, does not allow hearsay, or at least is interpreted as not allowing hearsay. And the case here is the Faruqi case. This, uh, this is a, uh, the Faruqi case is a seven circuit case. And basically the bottom line there is that rule 106 does not permit parties to introduce evidence that is otherwise hearsay, all right? So let's look at what happened here. Uh, and again, this is a case that is uh, right in my, in my book as an example. Um, so a trial here, the, uh, the subwire fraud case, the, uh, the defendant tried to cross-examine a witness about portions of a conversation between the witness and the defendant that were not part of transcripts that the government had presented and audio that the government had presented. So here we have, um, this is parts of a conversation between the witness and the defendant uh, that were not part of what the government had already presented. The defense here is arguing this portion should be coming in. They should be coming in under rule of, of uh, uh, under um, and, and, and under 106 uh, uh, that uh, uh, that uh, uh, that you know that part of the statement should be coming in in fairness. Now. Um, you know, so here, in a, uh, the government objected, arguing that the defendant attempted to in, attempt to introduce his own statements, violated the hearsay rules because the statements were not subject to the party opponent exception. Why? Because it was the state the the uh, defendant's own statements that uh, that the defense was trying to go ahead and introduce. Now, the district court judge held that the rule of completeness did not apply. Why? Because the statements that the defendant was trying to introduce were hearsay. Again, there were his statements in discussions with the witness out of court, they're hearsay. They don't come in as opposing party statements, obviously, because it is himself that had made those statements the defendant had. So they are hearsay. And the court, the district court, you know, uh, and then the Seventh Circuit both say, you know, too bad, so sad here. You know, they, uh, yes, the part of the statement that the defense wanted would have clarified much of what the prosecution had introduced, but in this case, it is hearsay. So this case illustrates the two problems that we have with the rules. One, the fact that the rule is limited to writings or recordings, and then second, that hearsay is not allowed. So then, where are we at right now? Well, you know, where we're at right now is that the proposed statement, you know, uh, or, or the proposed, I'm, I'm sorry, amendment would basically allow for, uh, it would include for uh, completeness uh, of using any type of statement in any form not just written or recorded, but also oral statements, also um, uh, conduct or, or something like, for instance, sign language. So oral statements would come in. And again, that will solve the problem that we discussed in, uh, uh, in, in, in the first case that I, that I mentioned, the Liera Morales case. So uh, under the amendment, oral statements would come in. In addition to that, the amendment would allow completion over a hearsay objection. That would take care of the problem that we saw in Faruqi. Okay, 
So again, the amendment is designed to deal with those two existing problems through the federal rule, through the federal rules of evidence, federal rule of evidence 106, the rule of completion. Um, and the idea, of course, you know, the idea is that a party who presents a portion of the statements, the government presents a portion of the statements in a manner that distorts their meaning, then they forfeit their right to object to completion based on hearsay grounds. That's the idea behind this proposed amendment. Now, so what's the status of the amendment? So right now, this amendment uh, has been approved by the advisory committee. Uh, the comment period has already closed. Uh, the proposed amendment was already approved by the standing committee uh, of the judicial conference, and it is expected to become effective by year's end. I think generally this is a change in the rule that probably will end up being beneficial for our side. Sometimes it may be a challenge, but I think that you know, but overall this amendment is probably going to be beneficial for us. Um, Renee, we yes. did have one um, question a few moments ago. Of course. Um, just to get some clarification on the point that this viewer asked, um, if the defendant seeks to introduce his oral statements under 106, would that not open him up to impeachment even if he does not testify? So they were requesting some clarification on that. So, you know, so now let's say, for instance, that, you know, that uh, we got statements that, you know, already, you know, come in. Uh, they, uh, so the question would be, you know, the defense wants to go ahead and, uh, and and trigger the rule of completeness by bringing in statements of the defendant. The question is, what are the risks at that point? You know, is there a risk that, you know, there may be a potential for impeachment, you know, and, and, and that sort of thing, potentially. Potentially, that could be the case. I mean, it really would depend upon the facts of the case. And if you have a situation like this, if you're faced with a situation like this, and uh, uh, depending upon the facts, that may be a problem. Uh, if you have a situation like this and you like to go ahead and reach out to me and talk about it, by all means, please go ahead and do that. Uh, under certain situations that could be problematic, for the most part, uh, the risk already may already have subsided by the fact that, you know, like for instance, in Faruqi, you know, they, uh, um, statements by the defendant and the witness were already introduced by the government, uh, were already introduced by the government. And, you know, an argument can easily be made that, you know, they, uh, that 106 is supposed to go ahead and, and, and apply in fairness to, you know, to, uh, to, 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 to make sure that, you know, that uh, the problem that the government has created by it presenting the statement in a manner that distorts its meaning, that's the purpose of 106. And if the government now, you know, is, it creates a problem that we need to resolve, and then they say that we open the door for impeachment, I mean, that would be terribly unfair. And it would really, you know, it would really uh, be counter to the purpose of the rule, to the spirit of the rule. However, as I said, there may be circumstances where that's something that we need to be careful about. It is a good, very good point. You know, be you know careful about that. But I think that an argument can easily be made that the government cannot go ahead and have its cake and eat it too. The government creates the problem that triggers the necessity of the rule of completeness. We need to come in and fix the problem because the government was playing unfairly, and then. You know, the government now says, oh, but now is it because the, the defendant, you know, fixed this. Now we can go ahead and bring in all this impeachment stuff. So I think that it's an easy way to get around it. But again, as you know, as everything in evidence, it really depends upon the situation. And it's, a, it, it's something that, it's a, that, that, that is certainly important to keep in mind. So I appreciate that question uh, because, again, it's something that, that uh, that we need to be mindful of, but I think that we have an easy counter to that. And is that the government created a problem, the government cannot now benefit 
by in us having to fix the problem, they can now say, oh, the defendant now gets to be impeached. I hope that answered the question. Okay, now, um, so having talked about the rule of completeness, let's go ahead and shift gears and talk about illustrative aids. Now, this is actually, uh, this would be a new rule. Now, the rule of completeness, basically, there will be changes to a rule, as we discussed, changes that would allow for oral statements, changes that would allow for hearsay. Here, we're actually talking about basically a brand new uh, rule, really a brand new subsection. Now, let's look at this. So, uh, we have illustrative A's. The rule that would probably house this subsection, if there was to be a rule, there isn't a rule right now on illustrative A's. If there was to be a rule on illustrative A's, it would be 611 that would house that subsection. Currently, that rule outlines or covers basically three big topics. One that is control of the court of examination. 611, after all, deals with mode and order of examination of witnesses and the presentation of evidence. So, you know, that rule deals with three broad topics. Again, control of the court of examination the mode and order of examination. It deals also with the scope of cross-examination. And lastly, it deals with leading questions. Now, the advisory committee on the rules of evidence concluded that, you know, that there is an issue, a problem right now with how courts are dealing with illustrative aids and felt that you know, an amendment uh, is in order. And it also felt that this is a rule that would house that as a subsection. So existing federal rule of evidence 611 does not cover illustrative aids, but this new rule would be a subsection of 611. Currently, it doesn't cover it. Now, let's go ahead and, and, uh, and talk about illustrative aids. Of course, illustrative aids can come in a ton of different, you know, uh, uh, um, shapes. For the most part, they are used by the government, but you know, certainly occasionally we use them as well. But here you're talking about, you know, your old school blackboard drawing in the middle of trial. You know, you're talking, you're talking about diagrams. You're talking about PowerPoints. Now, to be clear, we're not talking about PowerPoints used by uh, by either party in opening or closing argument, I'm talking about PowerPoint being used during the examination of a witness. All this is playing out in the examination of a witness, not in the way of argumentation, either uh, in, the way, in, in opening uh, argument or opening statements or in, in, uh, in closing argument. You have video depictions, you have charts, graphs, computer simulations, you name it. Now, so all this you know, are things that would come under this potential new rule. Now, so what are the problems that they were identified by the advisory committee on the rules? And parenthetically, at the very beginning of the PowerPoint, I, um, I put a link there that is a link to a report of the advisory committee on the evidence rules, uh, this is public. Everything that, like I said, I'm a member of the committee, but everything that I that I discussed about the committee here is public. This you will find in a um, in a link that I that I put at the very beginning of the PowerPoint. And what you have there is a report of the of the uh, advisory committee on the evidence rules summarizing this proposal that I'm discussing is a really handy uh, uh, little um, little memo uh, that's only uh, that, that there's just a handful of pages but you know but it talks about all the uh, the changes here that I am talking about at any rate um, here what we got is that um, the problem as identified by the advisory committee is that illustrative A's are used all the time. I mean, it is rare the case 
where it, they are not used and, and certainly used very heavily by the government. You know, you have the, the officer gets down from the stand and, you know, throwing a, 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 a you know, a diagram and, or you have the government expert, you know, showing the trajectory of the bullet, you know, that sort of thing. So you have all this illustrative aids. The problem is that there is no rule currently existing that directly controls them. And there is court confusion. There's a, a lot of courts get, get illustrative aids confused with actual exhibit, okay, with uh, or with actual evidence, evidence that is going into the jury room. And a lot of times courts end up allowing illustrative aids to go back into the jury room. That should not happen. So the purpose of this amendment is really more to clarify things, to create you know, clarification in an area that is heavily used. So both courts as well as litigants you know, know better what is the topography of the land when it comes to illustrative aids. So let's look at the proposed amendment here. The, uh, and uh, the proposed amendment here is going to have two parts. We're going to talk about both. So uh, the, again, this would be section D to rule 611. Right now, 611 has three parts to it. 611, as I mentioned earlier, deals with mode and order of examining witnesses. Uh, it deals with the judge's role in controlling uh, uh, questioning. And also it deals with the scope of, of a cross and with direct to specifically that you know that uh, um, uh, that leading questions should not be had in direct except for certain uh, certain uh, uh, you know for certain instances where you know where uh, leading questions can be had in direct like you know transitional issues and that sort of thing. So this would be a new section to six eleven. It would be section D, and it would be illustrative aids. So then. You know, they, uh, they, it would spell out what the permitted uses are, that the court may allow a party to use illustrative aids. And uh, if its utility, the utility of the illustrative aid is not outweighed by the danger of some fair prejudice. So number one, you know, the, 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 the new rule, the new subsection would specifically articulate the fact that illustrative aids would be, un, would be governed would be analyzed under 403, prejudicial value versus its probative uh, or prejudicial effect, excuse me, versus, a, versus its uh, probative effect. So it would, it, it would basically codify the fact that, you know, the uh, uh, illustrative aid would only come in, would only, the, 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 the party can only use it if, uh, if it's uh, uh, if it, it if it's not substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice, the second thing that's important is that also it will create a notice requirement. It will create a notice requirement. So if the government is intending and using any of of uh, uh, of, of this, and this is just a sample list, you know, if the government is intending to use, to use diagrams video depictions, charts, graphs, all that stuff, the government would have to provide reasonable notice. Okay, so again, that would be, this, this, this would be part of the new rule. In addition to that, the, uh, the, the rule also importantly would make it very clear that the exhibits, the illustrative aid would not go back to the jury room unless all parties consent or the court finds uh, 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 using good cause under a good cause standard that it should go in. So those are three important you know, things. One, you, know, you have the prejudice you know, versus probative value um, analysis built into a rule, the new rule. Number two, the requirement of notice. And then number three, specifically stating that that exhibit ought to not be going to the jury room. 
making it very clear this is not evidence. Okay, this is not evidence that got admitted and is actually going back to the jury room. This is just an exhibit, an illustration. It's an illustrative aid. So in that sense, I think that the rule generally would, I think that it probably would be favorable to our side. Sometimes, you know, when you're trying to use an uh, illustrative aid, you may be constrained under the new rule in the, in the sense that you would have to give notice and, uh, and, uh, and that sort of thing. I think that, that for the most part, you know, it would be, this would be applying to the government. And I think that for the most part, it would be a good thing. Not always, not always, but I think that all in all, that would be the case. There would be more predictability in the using of exhibits. So in that sense, I think that it could end up being something that would be helpful, you know, to, to, to us. Now, what is the status of this rule? So this, this uh, uh, or this proposed rule, this proposed amendment to the rule. So currently the uh, proposed amendment was uh, uh, approved by the advisory committee. Uh, they uh, uh, now uh, the uh, standing committee also approved it for publication and comment and the public comment period just closed. It closed. Uh, it closed less than a month ago. Okay. Now, it, it, parenthetically, this rules, this potential amendments to the rules are always open for public comment. And public comment, I tell you, being part of the committee is taken really seriously. And I will say that whenever NACTO speaks, whenever NACTO comments, those comments are weighed very seriously. That's not to say that if, you know, NACTO weighs in, that's the way it's going to be, but it, 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 they are weighed very seriously. And that is, again, something that, you know, that, uh, that is a great thing about NACTO. It's a great thing about NACTO. It's a great thing about being a member, you know, is that we do have a collective voice, a collective voice by an institution that can exercise some degree of muscle and it's gonna go ahead and be heard. Now, so uh, we talked about the potential for a new rule, which would be 611D. Let's talk about another potential rule and that is gonna be juror question. And that would be 611E. Now, I already mentioned that currently 611 has three parts to it. One deals with control by the court. Another one is the scope of cross-examination. And then, uh, and then uh, the third is uh, leading questions in the context of direct examination. Now, currently the rule does not address juror questions, okay? Now, to be clear, I am not talking about juror questions at the end of the trial when the jury is already deliberating. The jury has a question about you know, uh, uh, about uh, 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 something that a witness said, or, you know, the jury may be close to being deadlocked and the jury sends a question regarding what to do. That's not the kind of questions I am talking about. Rather, these are questions to the witness. You know, you have a juror member that would like a certain question be posed to the jury. This is what we're talking about, you know, here. So then, uh, the committee, the advisory committee felt that under the circumstances, it's very important to have a rule that would govern this practice. This is happening in, in courtrooms in the country every day. Jurors are posing questions. And uh, however, there is no clear mechanism under the rules that spells out how that is done. This potential rule that would be 611E would govern this very issue. Now, so what's the problem as the advisory committee saw it? The problem is that, well, first of all, allowing jurors to ask questions has been a controversial issue for a very long time. And the, uh, and the real problem is that while it is very controversial, there is no rule that governs this practice. And there is a need, the advisory committee felt that there is a need for a rule that would address that practice. 
So then what happened here is that, um, that the advisory committee came up with a proposed amendment that would be, you know, 611E, as I mentioned. This proposed amendment would govern the practice of juror questions. Uh, the amendment would not take a position as to whether courts should allow this or not. That depends upon, you know, the court. Uh, so the, the, the amendment would not take a part on, or would not take a position, excuse me, in saying courts should allow this or should not allow it or nothing like that. Simply, it would be, if the court is gonna allow it, this is a procedure that should that, that should be followed. These are the safeguards that should be followed. Um, for instance, like jurors should not, you know, be able to ask the question directly. It should be asked by the court or by a party. Now, um, so this was the the, the proposed amendment. Uh, so, you know, first of all, the juror could be instructed if the court intends to, to do this. Um, that you know that uh, uh, that a question needs to be submitted in writing. That uh, juror uh, should not uh, ask the question directly of the witness. That a court, you know, uh, has the right to either decline to ask the question, or that the court can go ahead and rephrase it. And uh, that also an instruction to the to the jury that the jurors are supposed to be neutral fact finders, not advocates. So all this again are procedural safeguards behind this rule in the event that the court was to allow uh, a juror to ask questions. Uh, in addition to that, what would happen is that if a question is, is uh, submitted, the procedure would be um, the court would have to speak to counsel so each party has the ability to go ahead and make a record on whether that question should be allowed or not. Uh, the court under this rule would have to allow a party the opportunity to object to the question. And then again, you know, as I said already, uh, it is not the, the jury that is posing the question directly to a witness. It is actually uh, the court or one of the parties. This is the proposed amendment. And that again would be an amendment to federal rule of evidence 611. And it would come in as uh, uh, 611E, okay, 611E. So um, where are we at now? Okay, with this. So this committee, the, the uh, advisory committee on the federal rules made the proposal uh, to the standing committee. The standing committee, however, uh, had a lot of concerns over this. The concern being that you know if you know if there is an amendment, you know that a lot of courts would think that maybe they are now required uh, to go ahead and allow jurors to to post questions. That they are not required to instruct jurors that you know this is the procedure and all that. When in fact, nothing in the rule says that. The rule basically simply says that if a court is going to do this, then the procedure should be A, B, C, and D. Very straightforward. The rule doesn't take any position on whether a court should do it or not. But you know, the standing committee or the judicial conference, you know, was concerned uh, about this. I guess like opening the floodgates to juror questioning and that sort of thing. And uh, in light of that. Basically, the advisory committee withdrew this, um, you know, this uh, uh, this proposed amendment, and uh, uh, now the advisory committee has a proposed amendment, but it's back to the drawing board with it. Now, if you have a situation, however, where you're in trial and the court, or even before trial, you know that the court is inclined to allow jurors to ask to post questions to the jury, then you should be asking that the court follow this procedure. You know, it, 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 while it's not a rule, certainly it's a procedure that makes sense and that, you know, that it um, it's gonna prevent this from becoming a runaway train and a free for all. So in that sense, at least this proposed amendment that was pulled back you know, gives some level of, of, uh, of 
some rational level, some structure to the process. So again, if you have a court that is inclined to allow it, you know, you can certainly ask the court to go ahead and follow the procedure outlined in uh, this proposed am amendment that was now uh, taken back. Okay, so now let's go ahead then and look at Federal Rule of Evidence 613. This is a uh, witness's prior statement. Specifically, I am talking about a witness's prior inconsistent statement. And of course, you know, that is, uh, uh, that is, uh, uh, in, that rules enshrined in Federal Rule of Evidence 613. 613 has two parts to it. The first part, A, 613A, deals with uh, showing or disclosing the statement to a witness during examination. We're not going to really get into that too much. We're going to be focusing on Part B of 613. Part B is extrinsic evidence of a prior inconsistent statement. So you have a witness on the stand, the witness testified for the government, the witness is uh, either say an informant or a witness that is, uh, you know, that, 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 uh, that is sympathetic to the government side. You um, have, knowledge of a prior statement made by that uh, witness, and you want to bring a witness to repeat what that other witness said, what that uh, informant or that witness that is uh, sympathetic to the government's cause. Do you want to bring in somebody else to show that this witness that the government presented uh, that that witness has made a prior inconsistent statement, okay? That's basically what we're at. This is how things look. That is the picture that we're looking at right now. And that's what 613 covers. And specifically 613B, uh, 613B, extrinsic evidence of a prior inconsistent statement. You getting this other witness that's gonna come here and it's gonna testify contrary to what the witness of the government uh, uh, put on the stand testified to. Um, so then let's look at what 613 has to say about that. And uh, uh, again, 613B deals with extrinsic evidence of a witness's prior inconsistent statement. Now, as foundational requirements, this rule requires that if extrinsic evidence is gonna be presented, uh, uh, say a prior inconsistent statement uh, that the opposing party have the ability to examine their witness, the witness that they presented on that statement, okay, on that statement. The thing is that the rule doesn't really say anything about the order of these things. So again, you have informant on the stand, okay? Well, the government has the informant on the stand. The informant says, of course, all kinds of terrible things about your client. That informant, however, told somebody else, you know, told uh, somebody else a very different story. And obviously you want that. That is a prior inconsistent statement. And for that to come in, you know, you want to, you know, you want to bring in this extrinsic witness. This, uh, uh, but you want that extrinsic evidence in. Now the rule, what the rule says basically is that if you bring that witness to testify uh, uh, to that inconsistent statement made by the government's witness, well, at some point the government has the right to bring back that witness, has the right to bring back their witness and ask them about this statements. You know, is it true that you made the statements to so and so and then you know they can deny or they can, or they can agree whatever but they have the opportunity to examine the witness about it now um an important thing here is that for it to classify as an inconsistency it can be you know an uh it could be an omission uh and certainly there should be an apostrophe there uh an omission can qualify an evasive answer can qualify uh, and, and, and let's remember, 
and consist of this analysis if it's being used against it, us, you know, is subject to a 403 um, analysis to for, uh, uh, to uh, prejudice versus uh, uh, probative analysis under federal rule of evidence 403. Now, this case here, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. This is a Tory case. This uh, uh, this case here um, uh, shows that for a statement to be considered inconsistent doesn't require too much. Let's briefly talk about it. Uh, Tory is a defense favorable case. It is in my book. Uh, here, the district court, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the case was a bank robbery, an armed bank robbery. Um, at trial, the bank teller testified uh, that the defendant had raised his shirt to reveal the butt of a gun stuffed in the waist of his pants. Now, on uh, cross-examination, uh, the, the, um, the witness testified that, uh, that he, that, that he meaning the uh, defendant had not worn uh, jogging pants. That in fact, the defendant had worn um, something like a white painter, white baggy trousers, so they were trousers, not jogging pants. Um, the defense felt that that was an important thing. That it was sure number one that you know the the the, the witness um, the witness's memory wasn't you know very accurate, and also you know seemingly uh, it, it advanced the defense cause to show that it was jogging pants because it was more difficult to you know to to put the gun there and that sort of thing than uh, if it would have been uh, this more like you know like white or uh, painter white baggy jean type uh, pants. The defense wanted to go ahead and uh, uh, present evidence from an agent that the agent had indeed said that a witness had had told the, the, the agent that the defendant was wearing jogging pants, which again, the defendant, the uh, witness had said that that was not the case. The district court said that is not an inconsistency. The rule doesn't apply. 613 is not triggered because this is not an inconsistency. It's a minor thing. You know, really, who cares, basically? You know, who cares and sit down type thing? Uh, the appellate court, however, said no. You know, this is, a, this is an inconsistency. To be able to trigger 613 doesn't require a whole lot you know, for it to be considered an inconsistency and it should have come in. So, you know, that's a nice little case in case you are faced with uh, that problem. Now. Um, Renee, yes. I apologize for interrupting you, um, but to add to this discussion, one of our viewers um, has suggested um, some clarification on a few points and she writes, um, that two of the points she has always kind of encountered difficulty with on this topic um, regarding extrinsic evidence of a witness's prior inconsistent statement. One, is this reciprocal discovery material that has to be disclosed to the government prior to trial? Or is it impeachment that does not have to be disclosed? And also for those in extrinsic evidence of a witness's prior inconsistent statement, would that be something that went back with the jury in deliberations like any other type of exhibit? I know, yeah, that's, I know that's a lot, but um, you know, anything you can add, or we can also um, direct more questions to you for response after the program. No, that's a great question, actually. Those two questions are actually great questions. So the first question really is an issue of disclosure. And uh, the second question is an issue of what goes back and what doesn't go back. And uh, um, now, um, so as to the issue of disclosure, there will be, this would be going in in the way of impeachment. So really there's no disclosure issues. You know? And usually this is gonna play out just like it played out in the Tory case, that plays out right there in the heat of battle. So, you know, the, uh, um, you know, the defense lawyer certainly wasn't expecting that the witness was going to say, I don't remember, you know, the, or I don't remember saying that the guy, 
had you know jogging pants. You know, I remembered in fact that the that the guy had uh, white painter jeans like you know pants. So usually you're gonna see this in the way of an impeachment. Usually this is not gonna be an issue with disclosure. Now, as far as the second part, you know, is this gonna be going back uh, to the jury room or not? Well, it depends upon, you know, whether you wanna have, uh, typically this is gonna be a statement, you know, it's gonna be a statement recited to the jury by, you know, this other party. In the Tory case, um, what the defense wanted was the uh, agent to testify to that, repeat what, you know, the witness had said, so in that case, obviously, it would be simply a statement that wouldn't be going, you know, back as an exhibit or something like that. If, on the other hand, um, you know, you have, like I say, a statement, you know, a statement that was written by the, uh, uh, in, let's, let's say in Tory, you know, by the teller. The teller, you know, would have written, and a lot of times it happens in those bank robbery cases, you know, the teller would have written, you know, a statement to the agent, the FBI agent interviewing them about, you know, what happened. And let's say that there it included the fact about, you know, the pants and all and all that. Uh, well, you know, you can certainly try to get it admitted, you know, uh, not just as an illustrative aid, as we discussed, we discussed the difference between illustrative aid and exhibits that are actually evidence that are going back to the jury room. Um, you could try to go ahead and get it admitted, but you may encounter, you know, issues with additional hearsay, you may encounter other problems there that really would become you know, a very heavily fact-specific question that, um, that, that, that I would need to probably know a little bit more about. Um, so as to those two excellent questions, really uh, typically that's gonna be, again, you know, an, an, an issue where the source was not necessary beforehand, uh, because usually it's gonna play out anyhow uh, prior to trial. And then number two, you know, usually this is gonna be the repeating of a statement or whatever, sometimes, you know, you may see a written statement. There you may have the second part of the question, is that, is that gonna be going back to the jury or not? That really would be a very fact dense issue that, you know, that, that I would have to know more about the facts of that particular case. But excellent question. Thank you very much for that. And thanks for allowing me to clarify a little bit more about, you know, where we're at with uh, rule 613. Now, so what's the deal here? What's, you know, why is it that the, that the advisory committee uh, thinks that this rule needed to be amended, needed to be changed or whatever? Well, what happened is that prior in a common law, a common law prior to extrinsic evidence coming in regarding that, uh, that uh, inconsistent statement, the witness would have had to be given an opportunity to explain or deny the statement. So, you know, Mr. Witness, isn't it? The, is, is, you told the agent that my client was wearing jogging pants, right? And uh, of course, you know, you dropped it right. You don't want to go ahead and put the tag there at the end and that sort of thing. But assuming I am posing the question, you know, properly from a trial ad standpoint, um, usually that's how it, that is how it was handled in common law, at common law. Under the rule, it doesn't have to happen that way. You know, again, you know, you, you can choose to say, well, you know what, I'm not going to say anything right now. I'm not going to, you know, confront the witness regarding the issue of the jogging pants versus the, you know, the white painter jeans like pants. And instead, I'm gonna, you know, bring in the agent to testify as to that. You can choose to do that now under the rule. So the issue is that, you know, the advisory committee, you know, felt that first of all, a lot of judges still follow the common law on this issue, and you know, the advisory committee also felt that um, that a lot of times the witness is simply gonna go ahead and admit to it and say, yes, that's what I told the agent, or yes, that's what I told my neighbor, or whatever. You know, so the committee felt that that's the case, and the committee felt that because of that, you know, that, um, that, that would streamline things if there is a requirement that, in fact, the witness is asked first. Okay, so that's kind of where we're at with, um, with all this. Um, let me go to the proposed amendment right now. 
So uh, the proposed amendment right now would give the judge the discretion in certain cases to allow the witness later on to come back and explain what happened. Uh, but, but the amendment would require that, like at common law, the uh, witness is first asked. Okay. Now, say for instance, you know, the, uh, you have a situation where you know you uh, you cross examining this witness, and uh, the witness, you know, uh, uh, it, it, the the witness, you know, tells you that no, this, you know, your client was wearing a certain type of pants, like the ones uh, that we talked about in Tory. And then in the middle of trial, you ended up finding that, no, he had told somebody else that, you know, he was wearing sweatpants as opposed to painter-like pants. Then, you know, you can still, at that point, the witness already has, the, the teller has already gotten off the stand and all that. The rule would still, uh, the amendment to a rule would still allow you to bring in that person because you found out about it, you know, during trial. But you know the rule really would um, would basically go back to how things were done under the common law. That is, that the witness be allowed the opportunity to explain first. Okay, so that really is kind of what the uh, this amendment is going after. Um, the uh, the amendment um, already has uh, um, gone through the standing committee. Uh, the uh, standing committee uh, allowed it for. Uh, publication or public comment, and uh, the uh, the uh, public comment period, you know, just closed uh, uh, just a few weeks ago. Okay, so we'll see what happens with uh, with that one. Now, another one. This one could be a big one for us, and this is uh, this is I think probably bigger than the one that we just discussed. Uh, and here we need to be careful. I think. This is a potential amendment to the rule of sequestration to 615. So then, you know, uh, let's look at the rule of sequestration here and uh, that's 615. And of course, under the rule of sequestration, a party, uh, at the request of a party, the court has to order witnesses excluded from the courtroom so they don't hear what somebody else is saying, another witness is saying, that makes perfect sense. Now, um, the, of course, the rule doesn't allow uh, for the exclusion of an actual person, uh, an officer of a corporation, uh, or, uh, or you know, in, in a, um, a person whose presence is essential. And of course, that's usually uh, the case agent. I'll give you a case. Uh, that's nice on that particular issue. The government oftentimes uh, uh, abuses that, you know, that exception there, and they'll have, you know, everybody at the table. At the table, it's a case agent. You know, they got, you got the government wanting to have the court, you know, designate several people as case agents. I'll give you a nice case to try to counter that. So then, what are the problems according to the advisory committee with? the rule as it exists, with 613 as it exists. So um, the problem, according to the committee, is that the current rule does not speak to instances where a witness learns of somebody else's testimony from counsel, from a party, from a witness's own inquiry. The, the, uh, um, the rule as it exists deals with the potential witness's presence in the courtroom, and uh, uh, and 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 not you know the not everything else like I mentioned just a second ago. The problem is that different circuits read this rule very differently. So in some circuits, you know, the rule is read to mean that uh, the sole effect of the rule is to physically exclude the witness from the courtroom. Now, other circuits, you know, hold that um, not only does that happen, that if the witness is indeed excluded, it's the exclusionary rule after all, uh, the rule of sequestration, you know, that the witness is excluded from the courtroom, but also that uh, the witness is forbidden 
from speaking to other witnesses, from speaking to the parties about the case, all this other stuff. Now, um, so the concern, the concern supposedly is that a person could be held in contempt for behavior not explicitly prohibited by the rule. Okay, uh, it, uh, I suppose so. You know, now, um, so the proposed amendment would basically say that uh, it would add a new subdivision to the rule, it would be subdivision B, stating that the court's order can cover disclosure or access to testimony, but the order has to do it explicitly in order to provide fair notice, okay? So again, the idea is that if the court, if, if that's what the parties want, if that's what the court wants, that's fine, but it has to be done explicitly. Now, and that's fine. I have no problem with that. The, the, the concern, however, is that I, I think that now we need to be clear in what it is that we're asking the court. And certainly, you know, if in fact now, now the status of this uh, potential amendment is that it's been, uh, uh, it's, it's been already approved for comment. It's been, uh, uh, it's been approved by the standing committee. The amendment has already been transmitted to the Supreme Court and Congress. It's expected to take effect at the end of the year, at least no earlier than the end of the year. But that's the expectation. The expectation is that this is going to pass. I think that now we need to be more careful with this. I think that when we are triggering the rule of sequestration, we need to be more explicit in what it is that we want the court to go ahead and do. Otherwise, you know, we don't want to have a situation where, you know, where um, the court is construing it and the circuit is construing it to mean that the only thing really that's prohibited is for the party, uh, for the witness uh, to be in the courtroom. So I just think that we need to be based on, especially based on, on this amendment, I think that we need to be clear with what it is that we want the court to go ahead and, and, uh, and order. And I think that we need to be clear in asking that the court, you know, make sure that you know that it covers in its order uh, the witness not talking to other witnesses about you know their testimony, not talking to the parties, etc. So I think that again, you know, we just need to be a bit more careful. Um, I put a case there. It's obviously in the PowerPoint. It's a favorable case. It's a good case. This is a good case when the government is trying to go ahead and have more than one agent designated as the case agent. And you see that a lot. You know, this is a good case saying, no, no, that, that, that rule doesn't work that way. So just keep that in mind. Again, uh, Vanessa will make the PowerPoint available to you. Take a look at the Farnham case. If you're uh, confronted with a situation where the government is trying to go ahead and get more than one agent declared the case agent. Now, Let's go ahead then and shift gears and talk about testimony by experts, okay? Now, um, this is, I think, a really good change for us. At least I'm very hopeful. Of course, you can see, you can say, well, you're a defense lawyer, hope springs eternal, that's part of our nature and this and that. But I actually think that this is gonna be a good thing. Let's quickly review this. Obviously, I have given presentations before dealing with experts. You know, take a look at them, um, but let's cover it really quickly. Let's cover, you know, the state of the law currently on 702. You know, of course, uh, 702, which deals with experts. Um, an expert, first of all, has to be qualified. Uh, the, ex the, the expert testimony has to be helpful. Uh, the expert testimony has to be based on sufficient facts or data. It's gotta be based on reliable principles and methods, and it's gotta be reliably applied. Okay, all that is in the rule as it exists. The rule is fantastic. It is a great rule. Um, and of course, you know, Dauber, you know, fleshes out the rule, fleshes out what's necessary from the standpoint of reliability, uh, et cetera. And here you have, of course, you know, some of the non uh, the non exclusive you know uh, Daubert 
factors uh, and this are five of them. You know, the theory or technique has to be tested, uh, peer reviewed, you look at a rate of error, you look at the standards uh, and widespread acceptance, et cetera. At least the court is supposed to go ahead and look at that. The problem, of course, is that we have, as I said in prior presentations, a horrible problem with junk science in this country. Uh, and that it, and, and it is truly a national epidemic. And here I have some excellent articles, three excellent articles from the champion. Champion's a phenomenal publication. And here you've got three great articles from the champion, fairly recent articles, you know, outlining the epidemic that we have nationally when it comes to this junk science to faulty forensic science that the government uses constantly in cases. And of course, you know, we had the National Academy of Sciences report back in 2009. We had in 2016, the PCAS report that the President's Council on, of Advisors on Science and Technology. And both reports were unanimous that when it comes to forensic science, it is a mess. The landscape is a total mess. Courts are not performing their gatekeeping function under 702, under Daubert, um, that unfortunately the expected sea change that was gonna take place when uh, 702 was adopted, when Daubert came through, when they, uh, uh, National Academy of Sciences report was published, when the PCAS report was published, all the sea change that we were expecting to see never materialized. And still, you know, courts continue to go ahead and be blind to the fact that science says that a lot of this stuff that we see constantly in criminal cases like bite mark analysis, uh, latent fingerprint analysis, firearm analysis, tool mark analysis, foodware analysis, hair analysis, all that stuff is junk. And, and science says so, you know, and, uh, and all that is well documented in, in both the, the uh, National Academy of Sciences report and the PCAS report. The problem is that courts are still stuck and the committee sees several problems with the way that 702 is currently operating. The committee actually sees no problem with 702. 702 is a great rule. It's just that it's being horribly misapplied by judges. And it's just being misapplied in two really significant ways. One is by hunting. And uh, the other one is by overstatement. Let me talk about each in turn. So the first one is that, you know, by punting. Basically, a lot of judges are saying, you know what, this is too, this is too confusing for me to figure out. Let the jury figure it out. And I'll say that it's an issue of, you know, it's not an issue of admissibility. It's, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an issue of, you know, credibility of weight. The jury can give it whatever weight it feels that it should, you know, and, Basically, a lot of courts are punting the problem and letting the jury figure out whether, in fact, uh, this evidence falls, you know, whether the expert testimony the government's presenting, you know, is, uh, is, is evidence that should be coming in under 702 or not, as opposed to a court actually doing the analysis itself. So it's a big problem, the problem of punting. You know, judges are letting the jury deal with the problem when in fact it is the court that should be acting as a gatekeeper, ensuring that the evidence that's coming in meets the qualifications of 702 and it's just not junk being uh, repeated by some uh, paid mouthpiece of the government. Now, the second problem, as I said, is overstatement. And that is where you have the expert and you see this all the time, you know, you see it like in a, in, in tool mark uh, evidence where you have an expert testifying as to, um, as to say rifling issues and they say, oh yes, most absolutely 
this uh, uh, the, 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 the bullet was indeed fired by this firearm, when in fact, the science doesn't support that. That is not a reliable application of the methods that were used. Even assuming that the methods were used, they were not applied properly. That is an overstatement. And that is a huge problem going on. So right now, basically, the advisory committee identified, again, a couple of problems. One is judges hunting, letting the jury be the ones that really is doing like the Daubert analysis, when it's the court that should be doing it. The, 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 the 702 analysis should be done by the court, not the jury. And second, this problem of overstatement where you have, you know, you, and you've seen it a thousand times. You got the government's expert, you know, uh, overstating really the significance of whatever it is that, you know, they're testifying to. Now, um, and like I said, this is a typical example. The bullet came from the defendant's gun when that's not supported by the science, you know. Perhaps at best what they could say is that, you know, okay, so the defendant, you know, had an M16 and uh, the bullet that was fired is consistent with that. You know, it's consistent with that, but, you know, you cannot say the, the science doesn't support saying, yes, this bullet was indeed fired by this gun. That's not, you can't say that. So that's a problem with overstatement. So what would this proposed statement do and say under the, this, this statement, the statement, I'm sorry, the amendment, the amendment doesn't change the law. The amendment doesn't change anything that's already in place. Instead, what the amendment does is that it makes clear what it is that the judge is supposed to be doing. What is the role of the judge? What is the role of the jury? And it's kind of like basically saying, judge, you're the one that's supposed to be doing this. It's part of your job. You're getting paid to do this. You're not getting paid to punt this issue to the jury and let the jury figure it out. This is not an issue of, uh, of weight. It is not an issue of credibility to be left to the jury. Instead, it's an issue of admissibility that you need to figure out. And it may be hard work, but you need to go ahead and do it. So the amendment, uh, the, the amendment to 702, uh, what it would be doing again, is not adding anything, really making it clear that the court is supposed to go ahead and engage in this analysis. So according to the amendment, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the judge is required to go ahead and make the, uh, the admissibility requirement. The judge is the one that's supposed to go ahead and take the expert opinion testimony and, 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 and act as a gatekeeper. Second, you know, the judge would have to also determine that in fact, the methods were properly applied and that the testimony of the expert matches that. So there is no, uh, so, so, so we avoid the problem of over-representation, you know, of overreaching by the expert saying, oh yes, this bullet was indeed fired by this very gun when you can't make that determination. Where are we at with this? So the proposed amendment has already been approved by the advisory committee. The common period has been closed. They, uh, uh, it's been approved by the standing committee, and now it's been transmitted uh, to the Supreme Court and Congress. It is expected to take effect later this year. I think that this is gonna be a good thing. And I think that even now we can go ahead and be pointing this to a court, you know, really reminding the court, it's your job to do this. But my hope is that this is gonna be one of those things that will serve you know, to emphasize the fact that the court needs to do this and the court cannot just let the jury deal with it. So I hope that this is gonna strengthen the 702 analysis and hopefully it will keep a lot of the government junk out. That's, you know, of course, the, the hope. Um, now, I wanna take a moment here to emphasize what I said earlier. This was an amendment where, uh, where um, NACTO weighed in, what NACTO weighed in in favor of this amendment. Uh, and uh, this was an amendment that, uh, that, that there was a ton of comments on, but NACTO weighed in and NACTO's position was taken very seriously in this regard. And again, you know, another reason why it is that we need to have an organization like NACTO that represents all of us 
because while our voices are certainly important, uh, it is our corporate voice in the way of something like like uh, an institution like NACTO, an organization like NACTO, uh, really does carry a lot of weight in this whole amendment process. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, and, and shift gears and uh, uh, and talk about uh, statements against. Interest as we're wrapping up here our presentation. Uh, statements against interest under 804B3. Now, this is an exception to the hearsay rule. Uh, remember, and, and of course, I covered this before in presentations on the hearsay rule uh, on hearsay. And uh, um, this is an exception that comes in under the requirement of unavailability. In other words, under Federal Rule of Evidence 804. So you have, have to, you have to have an availability for this exception to apply. You have to have an availability in the part of the declarant. Now, let's quickly take a look at an availability. And then, of course, you know, as I mentioned prior discussions, um, a witness is unavailable if absent and the proponent of the evidence cannot procure their attendance, if the witness has invoked a valid privilege, uh, if the witness dispute refuses to testify despite court order, if you have an issue like lack of memory, etc., or that all those are grounds for unavailability. And again, you cannot have uh, uh, statements against interest uh, or that exception triggered unless there is an availability in the part of the declarant, in the part of the person that made the statement. Now, um, currently, the this rule is a rule that oftentimes we want to take, we want to trigger, but it's really tough to trigger this, this rule. Why? Because, well, first of all, you have, you know, it's gotta be a, a statement against interest. It's gotta be uh, against interest because of the declarant's pecuniary or proprietary interest are, are, are at stake. And uh, um, the declarant's being subjected to either civil or criminal liability and uh, and the rule also includes a provision that uh, that if the declarant is the person that made the statement and remember that person now has to be unavailable if the declarant is inculpated but we want that statement in to exculpate the accused let's say for instance that one of the co-defendants says, you know, no, I mean, Renee was not really involved in that. You know, I'm the one that did it. And so the, you know, who, the, the Jose and, 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 and Roy were involved in it, but Renee was not, okay? Now, so there you have a statement that is inculpatory. Uh, and I wanted in at my trial to exculpate me, but then under the rules, we have to, we have to, we have to present circumstances that uh, corroborating circumstances clearly indicative of trustworthiness. I mean, this is a one-sided rule. It only applies to us. Uh, and I think it doesn't, it's very unfair, but that's the way that it currently is. Not only that, but a lot of courts really construe this very narrowly as we'll see. Before we see that, Let's compare really quickly. It's always important to compare party admissions to statements against interest. They're two completely different animals. Uh, statements against interest are an exception to the hearsay rule. Again, that requires an availability in the part of the, report, the, the declarant. Um, party admissions are not. Party admissions are made by the party. They don't require an availability. They just require that it's made by the opposing party. And uh, uh, of course, party admissions do not require that they, they be against interest when made. Statements against interest yet do require that they be against interest when made. And as I already said, they do require an availability. Party admissions do not require an availability. Now, uh, this is an example, a very simple example that I have offered in the past. And that is that uh, two people are in a car you know, they're in an accident. Um, the uh, lights did not, the car did not have its lights on. The passenger gets out and says to the officer, gee, you know, we really should have had our lights on. Well, obviously 
that statement is not a helpful statement, right? Now, is that a statement against interest? It totally depends upon who made it. You know, if I'm if I'm in the passenger seat and it's my buddy that's driving, and you know, he's the one that got into a wreck, and I come out and say, geez, we really should have had our lights on. Well, you know, I mean, what am I losing? That's no skin skin off on my back. It's not subjecting me to civil or criminal liability. So that probably would not be a statement against interest. Now, let's say for instance that, you know, that uh, that um, that the passenger, well, let's say it's me, let's say that we have my wife is driving, you know, and uh, uh, then uh, uh, I'm not married, but uh, let's say that it, that it is. And, and uh, they would say um, at that point, then is it a statement against interest? And yes, it would be a statement against interest because in that case, you know, it is it is exposing me to civil liability. You know, certainly my pecuniary interests are at stake. While I'm not the driver, you know, I am married to the driver, and you know, consequently there is potential liability. So it's a nice little example that you know distinguishing power. Now uh, let's talk about you know this case here is a. Uh, you know, it's a nice case here uh, that that uh, that uh, we, this is a case where the government is trying to use a statement and trying to bring it in under a statement against interest under the statement against interest exception to the hearsay rules. Mendoza is a nice example. What you know, what this shows is that you know a lot of times you have the government trying to bring in a statement made by a co-defendant that inculpates both the co-defendant and the defendant. Now, assuming that there's, for some reason, no brutal issue there, uh, the government is trying to use this, and that's what happened here. Now, in Mendoza, Mendoza is a conspiracy to distribute case, and what happened is that DEA agents have watched the co-defendant accept payments uh, during uh, a methamphetamine sale. The DEA agents um, approached the, uh, the uh, uh, co-defendant and uh, informed the co-defendant that he wanted her cooperation to find who was the source, the source of the methamphetamine. And the agent told the co-defendant that if the co-defendant uh, would cooperate that that cooperation would be made known to the government. Now then you know at that point the uh, the co-defendant went ahead and and, uh, and made statements that you know were inculpatory of the co-defendant as well as the defendant, the defendant that was being tried, Mendoza. Okay. Now uh, the uh, at, at a trial, uh, or before trial, actually, the uh, the defense, you know, files uh, uh, or objects to the use of that statement, you know, and says that this is not a true statement against interest. Why? Because it was made after the witness had already started cooperating, and uh, the district court, of course, uh, actually, no, not of course, I should not say that. The district court surprisingly went ahead and found in favor of the defendant. Uh, that's, that's, that's what happens to me for, I guess, uh, for, for, uh, for uh, uh, assuming that the district court is always going to find against us. It typically does, but in this case, it did. The district court went ahead and found in our favor. The government did an interlocutory appeal. I guess this issue was critical to them. And, uh, uh, and, 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 the, and the circuit court, the Eighth circuit, Agreed with the circuit with the uh, with the uh, uh, with the district court. This is not a statement against interest. Why? Because the person had already started cooperating. At that point, it was their expectation. The person that made the statement, the declarant, the declarant was unavailable. So that part of the rule was met. But the statement was not truly against interest. The statement, in fact, was to try to curry favor with the government. It was to try to go ahead and position themselves in a better position to try to go ahead and get a better deal. Nice little case if you're confronted with a situation like this one. Now, 
the problem with the rule as seen by the advisory committee is that the um is that it's the part about the defend if you if we are the ones that want this uh, statement in because the declarant inculpated themselves and exculpated our client the rule imposes this requirement that there's got to be corroborating circumstances that we have to show corroborating circumstances and in addition to that as I said, remember remember what i said a minute ago that some courts even construe this very narrowly in the sense that they say that this corroborating circumstances have to be inherent on in the statement itself okay they have to be inherent in the statement itself so for instance let's say that you have a court defendant let's you know let's kind of flip the situation that we had in mendoza let's say that that court defendant you know instead of inculpating the defendant or client you know the court defendant says they, 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 uh, the court defendant, the defendant was not involved. You know, I was involved in the uh, in the case, but not the defendant. Now, so some courts would consider that that statement has inherent uh, circumstances or corroborating circumstances, and most courts would allow that. Okay. Because the statement itself has, in theory, inherent uh, circumstances showing trustworthiness. Why is a statement made to an officer? You know, uh, the person would not have been making it unless they think it's true, et cetera, et cetera. They are definitely exposing themselves to liability. The person wasn't cooperating, so on and so forth. Now, let's say, however, let's tweak that example and let's say that that statement, you know, that statement. Uh, was actually made to a friend. It was made to a family member or whatever, you know. And uh, uh, and 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 oftentimes the court is gonna in in um in taking that statement is not um strike that. Let's take let's take the um let's take the example that 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 I that I that I already gave you. You have uh, a court defendant. Uh, speaks to the police, exculpates the defendant. Some courts will only say you can only look at the statement and its circumstances. You cannot look at the fact that that person also made the same statement to somebody else. You cannot look at the fact that that person repeated that to someone else because that is uh, extrinsic to the statement that, that is being offered. So a court in making a determination whether that statement fits under uh, 804B3, again, we want that statement to come in, but this, uh, this rule imposes a very heavy standard upon us that we have to show corroborating circumstances. And some courts, uh, here's the problem, some courts say that, you know, that, uh, um, that circumstances that are extrinsic to the statement. We're trying to get in the statement made to the police officer that our client is not involved, to the agent, our client is not involved. In making this determination, whether this should be coming in under 804B3, a lot of courts you know, say that we cannot look at the other statement that was made to somebody else, you know, the, because that would be extrinsic. So that cannot come in. I just cannot take a look at that. That cannot be part of the analysis of whether there's in fact corroborating circumstances that clearly indicate uh, trustworthiness. Well, the advisory committee wanted to get rid of that. You know, that that uh, requirement that or that um, that position or that some circuits take that um, that uh, um, that some courts, you know, cannot uh, that cannot look at extrinsic circumstances. The proposed amendment would direct judges to look at all the evidence. So in making the determination whether in fact this falls under the rule, whether there's circumstances that clearly indicate trustworthiness, then a court should look at all the circumstances. You have a uh, statement made to the officer, you have the statement made to somebody else. You know, here it seems like, yeah, this is credible. This is something that should be coming in. This is something that is trustworthy. 
So, you know, what they, what they, uh, um, what the committee intended is to make this rule, you know, a little bit broader, a little more lenient. So it's not so strict as uh, some circuits interpret it to be. Let's look at where we're at with this. Um, this uh, rule was already um, approved for publication. The publication period, you know, recently closed. So we'll see what happens. We'll see whether in fact it ends up, you know, being adopted or not. But I think this is something that at least in certain sort of situation, it could end up helping our clients. It's something that we definitely want to go ahead and keep in mind. And even though the fact that, you know, a, an amendment has not already passed, you can always go ahead and point to the fact that, and remember that link is there, that this is in the works and you can tell a court, you know, you're on, you really should consider this stuff. This amendment is in the works. This is something that should be considered by you. You should look not just at the at the statement itself and its it, its little circumstances. You should look at all the evidence inherent in the statement, as well as evidence independent of the statement. What was said to somebody else and that sort of thing. So I think this is something that, at least in certain situations, could help our clients. Now. Uh, this is the last one that we have, and we're wrapping up as it is. This is summaries to prove content, a federal rule of evidence, 1006. Usually this is uh, used by the government. We can certainly use it, but typically it's used by the government when you have a large volume of writings, recordings, photographs, and that sort of thing that cannot be uh, conveniently examined by the court. You know, so... Um, so what happens is that the government will bring in uh, the case agent and the case agent will come up with a storm chart or summary or, you know, like in a fraud case, uh, uh, calculations that, you know, that, 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 prove, um, that prove the point the government's trying to make. I'm supposed to bring it in, say, thousands of pages in uh, evidence and that sort of thing. So this rule deals with that. This is this summary rule, summary to prove content rule. So now, what is the problem with that? And uh, by the way, this is a good case. If you're confronted with situ the situation, I'm not gonna get into the facts of the case, but you have the citation there, is that if the government's trying to bring in uh, or trying to trigger this rule, the evidence that they're using for this summary or chart or calculation or whatever, all that evidence has to be admissible. And the evidence has to be admissible. Oftentimes the, the government and sometimes the district courts uh, will conveniently forget that. The problem here, according to the committee, is that some courts do not properly distinguish between summaries uh, that are used as evidence uh, and, and, and summaries that are used simply as an illustration. Uh, in fact, summaries come in as evidence according to the rules. And uh, um, some courts force the government or the party that's trying to bring it in, it could be ourselves, it could be the defense. Uh, courts make the party bring in all the evidence before being able to present the summary. And according to a rule, that's not the way that is supposed to go ahead and, and work. You know, the, the summary is coming in as evidence and the party trying to bring it in, typically the government, doesn't need to truck in, you know, the thousand pages or more of, um, uh, of documents and that sort of thing. So the proposed amendment is that uh, the, uh, the proposed amendment will, first of all, cross-reference illustrative aids Making uh, making it clear that this this uh, rule 1006 doesn't deal with illustrative aids. That this is actual evidence, evidence that goes back into the jury room. In addition, the amendment would clarify that a summary is admissible whether, in fact, the underlying evidence was admitted or not. The underlying evidence still has to be admissible but doesn't have to be admitted, okay? So this is, again, this, the, the, the thought is that 
this makes it clear that this is just not an illustrative aid. This amendment makes it clear that, you know, that again, the summary can come in without need for all the evidence and perhaps very voluminous evidence, you know, perhaps uh, say thousands of pages of discovery or whatever to come in that I have to come in prior to the summary coming in. Uh, the status is that um, the, the period of comment recently closed on that. This is an amendment that I think probably will be probably uh, uh, will for the most part, not in total, but for the most part end up benefiting the prosecution. As typically it is a prosecution, you see it in the cases, typically a prosecution is the one that triggers uh, this, this, uh, this rule 1006. So I think that for the most part, this makes it a little clearer for the prosecution. It makes it a little easier for the prosecution just because it makes it clearer to judges that the prosecution doesn't have to go ahead and admit all this stuff. Now, this stuff has to be admissible, uh, just like it is in, uh, stated in the Oros case. I give you a citation right there. But again, I think this amendment is going to make things a little bit easier for the prosecution. Now, um, for the most part, the amendments that, I, that I've covered are, you know, are actually, I think, good for the defense. Uh, it's important to note here that, uh, of course, you know, the amendment to 404B already passed, uh, passed in 20. 20, and the key thing to support 404B is prior bad acts. You know, prior bad acts are not supposed to come in to show propensity. They can come in to show, however, motive, intent, et cetera. You know, the mimic rule, uh, it can come in to show that, but not propensity. And of course, you know, the rule was amendment, amended. So now the government has an affirmative obligation without us having to request it to go ahead and tell us what it is that they're trying to use to identify the bad act, to articulate the non-propensity reason. You know, it's an identity, it's a, you know, modus operandi. How is it that they're trying to use it? And uh, they have to do all this in writing prior to the trial. So this amendment is not in the works, it already got passed, uh, but still it's fairly recent. And I think that this was a positive amendment, you know, certainly for us. And that now it makes the obligation of the government clearer when it comes to the notice issue. So then um, we covered a lot of stuff. We covered the rule of completeness, illustrative aids, juror questions, uh, witnesses' prior statements under 613. We cover expert testimony, uh, statements against interest, and summaries to prove content. For the most part, I think that this uh, amendments that are in the works are, are, for the most part, good for us. We need to, you know, we need to keep an eye on them. I think we need to push hard, especially with 702, uh, because I think that in, in the end, this is going to be beneficial for us. Some of the amendments, I think, like for the one for 1006, is probably going to end up benefiting the government more than us. But overall, I think it's a good packet for us. Uh, and uh, and with that. You know, I, 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 I leave you, please join us in April. In April, we're gonna be talking about pitfalls and how to avoid them when it comes to evidence. And I, as always, I am so thankful to Vanessa and to NACPO for allowing me to talk to you. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you for the wonderful you, the work you do in uh, defending the constitution and protecting your clients. And with that, um, uh, thank you very much and until April. Thank you very, very much, Renee. Again, another incredibly informative installment in this series, and we are very grateful to have that.